What I'm going to do for you tonight is to talk about bringing the Utoxta Canal back to life. Um, I'll, I'll start and tell you how the canal came about in the first place. And then we'll take you for a, a virtual run down the line of the canal so you can see where it is. And then, of course, we'll talk about the restoration and the things that uh, have brought that about and how we've got to, to where we are today. So let's get started. And um, Utoxta Canal came about, well, there was never really, curiously, a plan to build the Utoxta Canal in the first place. Uh, this is a map that shows more or less how the, the canal network looked just before the Utoxta Canal came about. Um, what's significant about this, for, for those of you who know the canal network as it stands today, is that the Trenton Mersey is the only north-south route. Uh, there is no Shropshire Union at this period of time. And the uh, Trenton Mersey Canal Company was an incredibly successful canal by the mid-1970s. It was raking in the profits, but it was also frustrating its customers. Um, Harecastle Tunnel was very definitely a bottleneck, um, Cheshire Locks were a bottleneck. Um, there was a shortage of water, um, water was being drained off the cold and in the summertime to, to help out with that, but it really was not, not going terribly well, um, as I say, unless you were the Trenton Mersey Canal Company. And a project came along to bypass the Trenton Mersey. The line that I've just put up there is the line of the proposed commercial canal and the commercial canal would have joined onto the end of the, of the Chester Cut at Nantwich, come across through Stoke-on-Trent, then cross the Trent and Mersey again at Burton-on-Trent, just at the point where it becomes a wide navigation, and carried on to the end of, well, the Ashby was still being built at that point and it was running into financial challenges and it wasn't really quite happening. But this seemed like a, a very good way to do, to do this. And this would be really, really good news for everybody, unless you were the Trenton Mersey Canal Company, of course, for whom it was very, very bad news indeed. This would be a wide waterway, um, south of, um, of uh, the southern link to the Ashby. This was narrow canals at this time, but there was the opportunity for it to become wide. Um, so the, the Trenton Mersey Canal Company really knew that they, they needed to put a stop to this scheme. Um, and they, they looked at the maps and they established that on a second, there we go. Ah, there we go. Um, that Utoxeta was a key location. Utoxeta was not on the canal network at that time. And they figured that if they were to extend the Calden Canal from its terminus at Frog Hall down to Utoxeta, then that would give all the benefits of a canal connection to the people of Utoxeta and businesses of Utoxeta. And that they would be able to do that much, much more quickly than the commercial canal company who needed to build a very long wide waterway. And much debate was had about this. And in the end, they, they of course, got their way. And, and the commercial canal projects disappeared. It was never built. Um, but the Trenton Mersey Canal Company had a problem. They never wanted to build a canal to Utoxter in the first place. It was a, a very small market town. Um, the canal passed through a lot of countryside and, and through next to some very small towns, nothing really of any consequence. Uh, at one point, they suggested maybe we could build a tramway instead. But the people who talked to said, no, no, you definitely said you were going to build us a canal. So they eventually built the canal and they built the canal as shallow and as narrow as they could get away with. It was built in sections starting in about 1809 and by 1811 it had reached Utoxeter. So that's how it came about in the first place. So let's go and have a look down the line of the Utoxeter canal and we start at Frog Hall. Uh, so what we have on the map here, um, I'll get the laser going, there we go. So this is the end of the Calden Canal and the area that we know as Froggall Basin today. And the Utoxta Canal, as you can see, came off almost at the very end. Uh, and it's going to be this blue line that we're going to be following down on these Google Maps as we, as we head down the valley. Okay, so the first little bit is a, a drop down um, four locks and under what's now the A52 and starting to head out into the countryside. One of the real characteristics of this canal is, is just how rural it is. And here's a, a very typical view of the canal, how it looks today. I, mean, I took this picture a couple of years ago and much of the Utoxta Canal looks like this. It's a muddy ditch, it's got a lot of trees on it and uh, this, can, uh, this photo is quite typical in that you can see the Churnit Valley Railway very, very close to it. Um, the Trenet Valley Railway, of course, will be part of the story and we'll come back to that. But when you go to the next slide, it's really obvious um, how close the canal and the railway were. The canal 
of course, follows the contours of the hillside, but the railway, which came along later, cut a much straighter line. So here we are, this is Ross Bridge. Again, um, not a lot to see, certainly no business for the canal. Um, and this is a view uh, just close to Ross Bridge showing how the canal looked in that area. We now carry on slightly further to California Lock. Uh, California Lock, slightly unusual name. Uh, we still do not know why the name came about. The canal predates California in the USA, but of course there's a California in Derby, so there may be a connection there. But this picture shows California Lock, which for a long time we believed was the only remaining lock on the Utoxta Canal. Um, that's now to turn out not to be the case. And an interesting feature, just maybe a couple of hundred yards away from California Lock, milepost 19. There it is in its original situation. Uh, you can see the towpath and the grass of the towpath and like much of the Utoxta Canal, the canal is easily identified because it's full of trees. Uh, it's still wet and muddy. Okay, and now we carry on into our first village and the first village is Oakamore. Um, the canal at this time sort of went down, well, there's no real visible sign of the canal anymore in Oakamore because when it closed, um, the line was completely filled in and turned into all the front gardens of these houses that you see in the foreground down here. Um, there we go. Um, it then passes through the village centre, past the Cricketer's Arms. And this is one side of the bridge that's visible in the garden of the Cricketer's Arms. The other side of the bridge has now been lost. And we head now out of Oakamore and back into the countryside. Uh, at this point, the railway and the canal are very, very close together. They're not even distinguishable on this map as two separate images. Uh, most of the time, if you were to walk down the railway today, and you can walk down the railway today, you see the canal off to your east um, by a very short distance, but in places, of course, the lines completely coincide. Here's a fairly typical view. Um, this is um, near to Lord's Bridge with the canal, obviously, on the left and the former railway on the right. And now we come to the next village and, and a village you might possibly have heard of, which is Alton. Um, there's a, a small leisure park in Alton that you may have heard of, yeah. And at Alton, the canal passed very, very close to what is now the railway station. The line of the canal is actually by the bay platform and I'll try and point it out. So the canal, line of the canal came th down here and then it went into the, what is now the railway tunnel on this side and it exited on the far side. So we'll leave Alton Station, which is a beautiful station owned by the Landmark Trust. You can stay in there, have holidays and carry on down the valley. Now, up to this point, we've he been heading sort of just south of east. And in the next section, the canal does more or less a right angle turn and starts heading south towards Utoxeter. And the, the load of um, tracks that you can see on the left hand side there are JCB's testing facility. This is the part of the country that JCB operates in and they need somewhere to test diggers. Now, we do have a cunning plan for that, but for the time being, they're testing diggers on what you see in the left-hand side of the picture there. Moving on, Smith's Bridge or Bridge 70, uh, a bridge that some of you no doubt will have visited. This is how it looked in 1963. It's quite different to how it looks today, but that will form a later part of our story. And we now move on to Crumpled Weir. Crumwood Weir is the point at which the Utoxta Canal crosses the River Churnit. A um, very unusual um, way of crossing the Churnit. And you can see um, this is a, a painting that was produced by Mike Fisher, who was a member of CUCT. And we tried to visualize and, and understand exactly how this worked. So in the picture, the canal has come um, from Froggall in the background and, and Utoxta is behind us, towards us. So you can see the boat there being dragged across the weir by a horse. And it looks quite precarious because there's no fences there, there's no protection whatsoever. But the reality is it's not at all risky because the water over the weir is maybe six inches deep. Um, so there's no problem there. And what we see on the left hand side of this picture is Crumpwood Floodlock. Um, as with many rivers, you need a floodlock, uh, and this just controlled the water levels on the next section of canal going, carrying on towards Utoxeter. 
Uh, normally the gates were left open and as you can see in that picture there were gates that could be operated in both directions at each end of the lock. So we carry on now again through countryside. This is dead waters and this section is, is certainly still in water and you'll see now that my Google Maps have got two lines on them. The, the dark blue line to the left hand side will form a, a later part of the story but for now we're going to carry on down the the, uh, the lighter blue line and we're going to head into the village of Denston and in Denston when the canal was closed it was bought by Sir Percival Hayward local landowner and he built a church on the line of the canal and the line of the canal is pretty much along those central gravestones there and uh, right through the middle of the church. So now JCB <laughs> this is the main JCB factory and as you can see the line of the canal passes right through the middle of it. Um, there were two locks under the, uh, under the factory and when the factory was built, which is in the early 1960s, the remnants of lock gates and um, also a milepost were found in this area. Carrying on past JCB, we now come to wood seats. And Woodseats was famous originally for Woodseat Hall. And Woodseat Hall, there's a picture of it from the 1930s. And when, Woodseat, when the canal first came along, the owners of Woodseat Hall did what happened with canals in a few other places. And they said, you can only put a canal there if it's decorative in front of our hall. Um, here's an aerial photo from 2012. And Woodseat Hall is, here, what remains of it is, is here. And the original decorative lake was all of this area, um, but now only a small part of it remained by 2012. Uh, the rest of it got filled in. When JCB arrived and they dug out their arena for their dancing diggers, the spoil from that was dumped into Woodseat Lake, which was a real shame. Um, but in the last couple of years, JCB have opened a golf course on this land and as part of that project firstly they are planning to restore Woodseat Hall and secondly they decided that it would be a good idea to put the lake back. So here's a picture of the lake being dug out and as you can see the canal is still there on the left hand side they had to keep it in water because it's a very very popular fishing location and here's a more recent picture of the lake back in water uh, so that's a nice little feature that's that's come back. So now we carry on beyond wood seats and op into open countryside. We're now into a very wide floodplain. The Churnit has joined the Dove just out of the picture to the left. And this is a very wide, flat floodplain. And the canal follows the contours. It follows what later became the line of the railway, as you can probably see from that picture. And it's only as we approach Eutoxeter that the railway and the canal deviate, with the canal following the contour around a very wide bend place called Spath and crossing what is now the A50 and then heading into Utoxeter on the westbound carriageway. Uh, finally it follows a line into the town centre. Now this looks slightly strange and you think oh the line's not been drawn in the wrong place. It, it has actually been drawn in the right place. The street pattern was added at a much later date and just did not respect the line of the former canal. But the terminus of the canal is an area which to this day is known as the wharf. And it was down that little gap between the two buildings there, here. And this is um, the canal warehouse is the further building and the canal manager's house is the nearer building. So that's the line of the Utoxeter Canal. Um, as you can see, it, it was very, very rural. There was lots of ideas of ways to make money with it. There was a suggestion of an extension to Ashbourne up the Dove Valley. Um, there was attempts made to, to promote business in different places. Oakamore was very successful. There was a lot of business came along in Oakamore, which expanded on the, the copper works at Frog Hall. And there was a little bit of business that came out of Utoxeter, but fundamentally it was a canal that never made a profit. Um, from 1811 when it opened to 1849 when it closed, it never returned a profit. And that closure came about because the Trent and Mersey Canal Company was bought by the new North Staffs Railway Company, the Notty. And here's a notice um, from the Derby Telegraph 
saying that the canal was due to be closed on the 15th of January, 1849. And that is what happened. After it closed, there was still, it was, I mean, it's said that it's the busiest time that the canal ever had because they were delivering ballast and rails and sleepers and all the stone that was required to build the railway that was there to replace it. And the North Staffs Railway were very, very keen to put this railway line down the valley because it formed part of the shortest route from Manchester down to London. And that was a, a really important thing for them. So the canal was closed apart from the first lock and the basin. Here's a picture from 1905 that shows uh, the Calden Canal in the foreground, the first lock of the Utoxeter Canal, and then the basin, which is of course there again today. And this site was very, very busy for, for a long time, I say just into the 20th century. But eventually even that closed and traffic on the Calden Canal pretty much disappeared. You can see there's railway tracks all the way through this picture. And a railway line was put right up to Calden Low, um, which was the, the quarry that was put there. I mean, it was the reason why the Calden Canal was put there in the first place. And with that business moved onto the railway, there was no real justification for, for the Calden Canal at all. So it was closed. Um, Here's a picture taken about 1960. Um, boats were able to get up there, able to get more or less as far as um, Hazelhurst, about halfway up the canal. But as you can see, it was a bit of a challenge, no balance beam. This is Stockton Brook Middle Lock. And eventually a sign appeared at Hazelhurst Junction, this length of canal not recommended for boating, which was probably putting it fairly mildly. And subsequently, another sign appeared at Etruria saying the Calder Canal is closed, but boats were still using it. But this is the start of, of a different mindset on the canals, um, and the leisure use was becoming more and more important. A key moment in the story of the Calder Canal, and therefore the Utoxeter Canal, was the IWA's National Rally of Boats, which took place in Stoke in 1960. Very, very well attended right in the centre of Stoke. For those who know Stoke-on-Trent, it was the wide section behind the railway station. And then there was also an exhibition in the King's Hall in the town centre. And this got a lot of people together talking about um, the Calden Canal, about the state of the Trent and Mersey Canal, and what could be done by this, about this waterway. Stoke-on-Trent Boat Club, who at this time had their premises in the centre of Stoke, um, right in the middle of the right-hand picture there, um, formed a Calden Canal Committee and, and started raising awareness. This was an event in May 1963 uh, at the Black Lion, which is halfway down the line of the Calden Canal. Uh, the, you can see there was a very, very good turnout of people. A lot of people were very interested in bringing the Calden Canal back to life. And the Calden Canal Committee formed itself into the Calden Canal Society. And from there, Lots of conversations took place with the British Waterways Board, with Stoke-on-Trent Council, with Staffordshire County Council and, and lots of other interested parties. And it was generally agreed that bringing the Calden Canal back to use was be a very, very good idea. And it rapidly became a, a community-led project. As I say, Calden Canal Society was very, very strongly involved. Here's a group of lads from Moorside High School Technical Studies Department. They were given a boat and told to fix a bit of towpath and, and to clean out the lock at Cheddleton. Quite amazing, really. Um, I don't really want to do the risk assessment on that picture. Um, these are 13-year-old lads. Um, but I definitely don't want to do the risk assessment on the following picture. So this is a group of young offenders um, being closely supervised and they were restoring Oak Meadow Ford Lock in the closed section of the canal. Now the guy who's hanging over the side of the lock is perfectly safe because as you can see his colleague is sitting on his legs. Nothing to worry about there. But all these groups of volunteers and the two councils and the county council and British Waterways Board succeeded in delivering this project. In September 1974, this was the reopening ceremony which took place in Cheddleton. I am in this picture and I'm not going to point myself out, but I was 12 years old. 
And the Calden Canal has become a successful waterway. It eventually was upgraded from remainder status to being a cruiseway. Here's another picture of the Black Lion, where of course the canal and the Churnit Valley Railway interact and have become very, very successful. So we had a real success story of the Calden Canal, but what of the Utoxeter? This was the picture from 1905 that I showed you earlier. By 2002, this was the same view. The Utoxta Canal had disappeared from sight in trees. And a proposal was put together by British Waterways, supported by European money, to reopen that first lock and the basin. Here's one of the plans that got involved. The Calden Canal Society were, of course, very supportive of this. IWA was supportive of this. And this was also the first time that WERG got involved, Waterways Recovery got involved on the canal, on the Utoxita Canal. So here's a before and after picture of the lock. It's definitely the same location. If you can see the tree, um, there we go. That tree on the before picture is that tree on the after picture. So great work done by work there and also by contractors that were brought into the site. And here is the opening ceremony where Julie Sharman from British Waterways, who was the local waterway manager at the time, opened the canal and opened the basin. At the same time as this work was going on, of course, there was bits of conversations about the Utoxa Canal. This isn't the Calden Canal, this is the Utoxa Tour. And, and at that time, the general view was they built a railway on it. That's what everybody said about the Utoxa Canal. But people started looking, some of the volunteers went and had a nosy and, and looked at different things. But the key event happened in Utoxeter because at the same time as the Froghall Basin was being reopened, the warehouse and the canal manager's house in Utoxeter were demolished as part of a new housing development. Um, really, really unfortunate timing, but it certainly was the wake up call maybe that the Calden Canal Society and, and volunteers and, and different people wanted Golden Canal Society at that point then decided to look very, very seriously at the Utoxta Canal and, and felt that there was a project to do here. The, the Canal Society eventually decided that it was going to reinvent itself. It changed its name to the Calden Utoxta Canals Trust and it added to its constitution some particular objectives in relation to the Utoxta Canal, primarily to make sure what just happened in Utoxta couldn't happen again. So these were the three key points. Preserve what is already there. Promote people being able to use the canal for recreation purposes. And of course, to investigate restoration. By this point, we were all very enthusiastic. I was on board by this point. And um, my colleagues and I were very, very keen to, to do something. But we were aware that, of course, we're a bunch of canal nutters. And, and we want to say that this is possible. What we needed was some independent evidence. And the independent evidence came in the form of this document. Uh, this was a study into the, the feasibility of restoring the canal. This is not a detailed technical document. It's about 80 pages long. And it just looked at whether it was possible to put the canal back, not in any significant detail, but just really looking at the ground and going, are there any showstoppers or do we actually have a project here? And that's the key phrase. The conclusion of the project is it's technically feasible. They did identify some significant challenges, but their conclusion was that there were no insurmountable problems in reopening the Utoxta Canal. Uh, a number of, of key constraints were identified in the reports. The first one is actually not on the Utoxta Canal. It's on the Calden Canal just round the corner and it's Froggall Tunnel, which is very low, as you can see in this picture. The second constraint, or the significant constraint they identified was that from Denston onwards, there were a series of pretty serious obstructions to restoring the canal. Um, it was essentially impossible to put the canal back after Denston along its original line. But the group that was meeting to talk about this project, and we had a number of project meetings while this was going on, one of those partners was East Staffsborough Council, and East Staffsborough Council said, we love the idea of this project, it would be really good for you, Toxeter, and we understand that you can't go back into the town centre, but how about you go to the gravel pits on the edge of the town? 
So that's where the dark blue line that you, show, you saw on the earlier picture came from. So Halcro were instructed to see if they could find a line from Denston down to the gravel pits in Utoxeter. The plan at that time was that the gravel pits were due to be worked out by 2012. Um, that hasn't happened yet. They keep finding more gravel, uh, but we're not ready for them yet. So it's not really a problem. But the study concluded that this was a deliverable project. Um, the original canal potentially could be restored with a number of very small deviations between Frog Hall and Denston. And then a new canal from Denston to the quarry could be built. They did, of course, put their finger in the air and say, what's it going to cost? These are indicative figures. 88 million pounds, not a lot if you say it quickly. It's that sort of number that we are talking about. But we have two separate projects. But most importantly, we have a project in the first place. And one of the key things that came out of the Halco report was a recommendation to call Newtox to Canals Trust what we should do next. And they said, go and find yourself a project, get yourself known, demonstrate your credibility and, and show the community that you've got a canal here that's, that's worth doing something with. With beautiful timing, we were contacted by Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. And Staffordshire Wildlife Trust were the lead partner in the new Churdick Valley Living Landscape Partnership. This was a consortium of a whole group of local projects who were of local organisations who were going to put together a single large bid into the Heritage Lottery Fund for a group of projects which would celebrate in the broadest terms the Churnit Valley. The Utoxeter Canal runs completely down the valley. It's, it, it is right at the heart of the valley. And the projects were, were canal, were railway, were woodland, birds, the river, farmers, local food, agriculture, a wide, wide range of projects. And we were invited to, to put projects into this pot. Um, in the end, 26 projects were delivered and two of those were Corny Toxic Canals Trust projects. So here are those two projects. Remember that milepost? We decided it would be great as a way of telling people about the canal to put all of the other missing mileposts back. There they are on the map. So the one that remains is milepost 19, um, but 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24 all fell within the Churnit Valley area, which ran down, it, it drew a line more or less at Denston. And, and so that's what we decided to do. Now, in the course of researching this project, we discovered that actually two of the other mileposts still existed. They were beside the bowling green in Denston. But we, we took a decision that we weren't going to ask for them back. That didn't seem like a good idea. Um, but what did seem like a good idea was speaking to the National Waterways Museum about the milepost pattern that was on their wall. So this was the milepost pattern that was used. It was made in the 1970s for putting the posts back on the Trenton Mersey Canal. It was reused for putting the posts back on the Calden Canal in the 1980s. And since then, it's sat in the National Waterways Museum. But helpfully, um, Julie Arnold is a, a member of our committee and, and it was her dad, Harry, who had been key in the delivery of, of the first project here. And Harry and Julie liaised for us within the National Waterways Museum and there we all are taking delivery of the milepost for it to be taken down to a foundry in the black country where new mileposts were cast. Julie was there when the first one came out of the mould and this is her photo taken that day. Um, and the mileposts were delivered back to us in red primer and our volunteers painted them up in the right colour scheme. Mileposts went into the ground um, over a period of a couple of weeks. We got little teams of volunteers. They're quite heavy. Each post weighs about 110 kilos. So you need some, some clever engineering to get them into the ground. But our volunteers put them all in and, and there they all sit. Uh, and that was a really, really nice project. Our second project in the Journey Valley Living Landscape Partnership was a bit bigger. It was a lot bigger. We decided that we wanted to restore a section of towpath 
and the bridge that was next to it. Remember that bridge that we showed the pictures from the 1960s? Um, here's how that bridge looked by the time we were starting to do the, the CVLLP project. And what we wanted to do was to get this bridge into good condition, get this canal into good condition and, and show people something that looked a lot like a canal. So the starting point was a study on the condition of the bridge. And one of our partners in CVLP, Staffs County Council, um, produced this report for us, which concluded the bridge was, was fundamentally in a pretty good condition, but um, it needed waterproofing, water was penetrating through the deck, and it also needed the parapets on both sides raising because those stones had been lost or rubbed away over the years. So the starting point was work forestry. Work forestry came along and after they posed for a photo on top of the bridge, they cleared about 120 trees along the line of, of where we were going to raise the towpath. And here, over a couple of work camps, we put the towpath back. As I say, the ground levels varied enormously in this area and it was very boggy and very wet. Um, but that new towpath that went in has, has changed all that completely. So in this picture, obviously the path in the middle, the canal is on the right hand side. And in this area, the canal dries out in the summer, but is wet in the winter. And on the left hand side there, you can see um, one of the volunteers cultivating our Himalayan balsam collection, which we're incredibly proud of. We have the best collection of Himalayan balsam in the country, I think. And we started to do some work on the bridge. We pulled all the, the moss and the vegetation off the side of the bridge. And this was so that um, consultants from Staffs Wildlife Trust could go and have a look for bats in the, in the bridge, just to see if there was any problem with that. Glad to say there wasn't a problem. But in the course of putting this project together, we discovered that there was a problem and the project came to a grinding halt all of a sudden. This is the state that it was in at the point it came to a grinding halt. You can see the new path on the left hand side and the bridge in the foreground. And the problem that we had was that if we were going to spend Heritage Lottery Fund and we would money and we were definitely going to spend a lot of their money, um, we needed to agree a maintenance agreement with the owner of the bridge for the bridge to be looked after for 10 years after the money had been spent. And the problem we had was nobody owned the bridge. And because nobody owned the bridge, we couldn't reach an agreement. And there was a lot of discussion about this. We went and looked at land register, we looked at the rail residuary board, we spoke to JCB and Alton Towers, all the local significant landowners, and nobody claimed to own this bridge. And we thought we were going to lose the project and it was going to stop at this point. But then, in December of 2015, um, a bright spark at Staff Smallman's District Council said, hang on, we could compulsorily purchase the bridge. Um, you don't need to know who owns something if you compulsorily purchase it. And then if we were to purchase it, we could sell it to the trust. And an agreement was reached that the compulsory purchase notices went up. And on, in January 2016, the bridge was acquired by Staff Smallland's District Council and the following day it was sold to the Trust for two pounds. And so now the Trust owns an asset, it owns this bridge and the water underneath it. It doesn't own any of the land around it, but it allowed us to carry on with the project. The challenge we got was that we'd lost maybe 18 months in, in dealing with all these legal issues and we were running out of time to deliver the rest of the project. The problem that we had was that you can't spend the money after September 2016 and we're now into January. We called on work and said, can you help us out? And work gave us two back-to-back -back camps to deal with the top of the bridge. So um, putting steps up the bridge and waterproofing the deck. There we go. That's that work being done. And that was hugely successful. I say two-week camp. Um, led um, by Gary for us, hugely helpful. Um, but there wasn't enough time to do the parapets with volunteers. We'd originally hoped to do this as a training project and it just was impossible. But we found a local stonemason, Julian, and Julian was uh, available and able to help us finish the last little bit of the project. So here he is preparing the stones to go on the top of the bridge. And here are the stones going into place on the bridge. 
and here is the finished product. The bridge was finally finished uh, two days before the funding ran out. So we did technically deliver this project on time and on budget, but it was a pretty close run thing. It was, it was quite a challenge. And a couple of years on, our towpath is, is starting to, to look good. The canal is starting to look like a canal. And, and it's definitely served its purpose. This, this project has, has been very, very successful. It's raised awareness of the trust in the valley and the things that we're doing. It built brilliant partnerships with organisations like the RSPB and Staffs Wildlife Trust, um, the Churnit Valley Railway, all sorts of different people helped us out and were supportive to us at different stages. We now moved on to the next phase. The next phase, of course, is maintaining it, that 10-year maintenance phase. So for the first time, we got local volunteer work parties up and running in this area. Um, this was the Trust, CUCT, in partnership with IWA, and work parties running on the second Thursday of each month, which up until a couple of months ago, they are still doing. And our volunteers were starting out, of course, trimming vegetation and uh, keeping the path tidy, keeping the bridge tidy, making it all look very, very nice. But there wasn't really enough work to do. We, we wanted to do more. And, and we started looking around for other things that we could potentially do. Uh, here's an aerial photograph of, of Bridge 70. And this is where Bridge 70 is. This is Crumpwood Pumping Station, the new pumping station, the line of the canal coming in here. And just down here is Crumpwood Weir. This was the, the location I mentioned earlier on in, in Mike's painting. And by this time, it was all very, very much overgrown. So we went in there and we started clearing it out and discovered that a lot of the stonework of the weir was, was looking very, very good. And that, that was a, a nice project for us, but we still wanted more. And, and we then started looking between the bridge and the weir was this location here. And this was Carrington's Lock. This is what Carrington's lot looked like. We walked past it lots of times on our way to Bridge 70, um, but we didn't really know what was, what was there. And our, our good friends in Work Forestry came along and did what they do best and revealed the lock for us. And we were astonished to discover that a lot of it was still there. So there's the, the sides of the lock. The top end of the lock was in incredibly good state. Um, and we are still working on this lock, still learning about it. It's a really, really interesting structure. Of course, it closed in 1849, so it's, it shows us what locks looked like in 1849, as opposed to locks today, which have had another 150 years of evolution onto them. I think the thing that surprised me most was the presence of the stock pump roofs there, um, but they are definitely um, dating back to, to when the lock opened. So by this time, we're, we're pretty well established in, in running WERG events. We've done maybe half a dozen WERG events and we've done local work parties for a couple of years. And we were asked to host uh, the first WERG family camps. Um, this was getting young people out into the valley, doing uh, a range of different types of tasks. We've hosted three of them now and they've done some useful work for us, cleaning up some stonework, building, as you can see here, bird boxes. They've built back boxes for us as well. They've pulled up Himalayan balsam. They've uncovered bits of stonework and, and lots and lots going on. As I say, it's been very, very good for us and we think the young people have enjoyed it. Several of them have come back more than once. Um, in the process of, sort of thinking about what we were going to do next, we started thinking again about the mileposts. We'd reinstated the mileposts as far as Denston, but the rest of the mileposts into Utoxta seemed like a really, really nice project that we might want to have a go at. We identified the locations of all of those mileposts as they originally were, and, and found that most of them were publicly accessible or were very close to locations that were publicly accessible. So we agreed with the landowners um, in those areas that we could reinstate these posts. And once it seemed like this was gonna be a, a, a goer of a project, we put out an appeal to our members to sponsor the mile posts. That project was fully funded within a couple of days, I think. 
It was a, a really, really successful project. Um, and we went back to the Waterways Museum. We said, can we borrow the pattern again? And they said, oh, go on once more. So another six mile posts were cast and there they all are um, in Mike's garage again. It's a slightly different stage of painting. And here are there, a couple of them going into the ground, milepost uh, 28, just on the side of a road. Milepost 29 was an interesting little challenge. The original location of the canal is here, um, but this is a plan of a rebuilding of the A50 dual carriageway. And as part of this project, uh, we had to agree a slightly new location for the milepost. And the new milepost location is just here on this footpath. It was originally there, but that's now no longer a publicly accessible location. But if you look at its location, it's actually got a, a panoramic view, both of the A50 and in a different direction of the original line of the canal. And when our line of mileposts finally reached Utoxeter, the mayor came along and uh, here's a photograph with uh, Philip and Philippa and um, the mayor and Peter. So we've, we've managed to keep the momentum going of, of what we've been doing, but I also want to think about big projects. What are we going to do next as a big thing? And, and this, is, this is my thought process. I want to rewater a length of canal and put a boat onto it. And of course, I'm thinking about the Crumpwood area because we started working in that area. And I'm thinking of the area, and we've started to look at the area working to the west from Bridge 70 back towards Alton. That seems to be a very, very good candidate. A lot of it is in water. And WERG seemed to support us. We've hosted three WERG reunions in this section. I'll flick through some photos of, of the WERG reunions that we've done. Here's the first one, um, very, very close to the railway in this section. And this was a, an amazing weekend where we completely uncovered a very long straight section of towpath, which was nice. This was the, the second one in 2017, um, slightly further along, about another quarter of a mile along from where we'd started. And on this one, we, this is a dry section of canal, so we were able to clear the canal bed out as well as the towpath. Here's the before picture, and if you look at the Y-shaped tree, here's the after picture. And the after picture revealed something we were completely unaware of, which is that little wall underneath the tree to the right-hand side. And it turns out that that is the wall for the wharf of Alton Towers. And we believe that possibly some of the stone to build Alton Towers was um, unloaded on this wharf. So that was a structure that we didn't know existed. One of the characteristics of this project has definitely been that we find things that we didn't know existed. Here's a bunch of guys looking into a hole and the hole they're looking into contains evidence of Charlesworth Lock. We knew it was there, but we didn't know where it was. So that was a, a great discovery from our point of view. As we cleared through this section, we worked in from the two ends near to the railway. So we cleared along there and then we started working in this direction from here and we started working in this direction from here because there was no way to get up into this middle section here. And in the middle section, of course, we discovered our, our big challenge. We discovered that a section of the towpath had been completely washed away at some point. Um, so our idea of creating a, a walking path down the towpath was going to need a little bit more engineering than we'd got at that time. So at the moment, we can't encourage the members of the public to walk along this section of towpath until we've, we've got a plan for how we're going to repair this. But you can walk in from both ends and have a really good look at it. Another interesting structure that we discovered, we weren't expecting, this is the exact moment at the time that a structure was discovered. And this is behind the tree there is, is Rupert. And um, what we're looking at is what appears to be a line of stone in the ground around there. Um, Maria, who's on the left-hand side of the picture there, had, had spotted something and, and we were going, yeah, there's definitely something. And Rob, who's hiding there behind Rupert, went home, as we all did, and within a couple of hours had turned up this map. Uh, and this is a map of, of how this area looked in the, the late 19th century after the canal had closed. And the area we're interested in is, is just here. 
So if you zoom in a little bit, you can see lots of trees, but you can also see something that isn't actually a tree. It's this structure here, and it's a spillweir. It's a spillweir that carried overflow of water from the canal into this mill stream. So bit by bit, we've uncovered that. Here we go. This is uh, one of our excavations on the site, and it's, it's quite a remarkable structure that it's just sat there and filled with silt over the years due to, to lack of use. Um, this is the tunnel that goes through to the canal. The canal's in the background on that picture. And yeah, each time we go down there, we, we discover something new. So the most recent work camp down there was last November. Um, here we are all arriving on site. And, and this is an interesting picture because it shows how wet it was on this day, but it certainly wasn't as wet as it was a couple of days before when we thought we didn't have a work camp at all. Um, this is the Black Lion in Consul, slightly further up the valley on the Calden, that's bridge 50 of the Calden Canal. And this is Alton Railway Station, um, looking slightly different. By the time we got to the site, this was picture was taken on the Monday, by the time we got to the site on the Friday, you can see the tide mark on the milepost there. And this was a very, very wet camp. Um, it, we didn't do the things that we wanted to do, but we did do a lot of other interesting things. So we split off into lots of little groups. Um, we did some bits of towpath clearance. The forestry guys were given a task to clear this area and underneath it we found um, a structure. We think it's possibly um, a sort of a, a small store or um, someone suggested that canal workers lived in there. We don't know. The canal in this picture is, is down the left hand side here. Um, we decided that we were also going to build the plinths for the mileposts there. Um, so these are our second six mileposts and also our, uh, some of our first set of mileposts putting the plinths in there because we were going to put plaques onto them. And then the final task that was done was this spillweir that we've uncovered was putting some fencing around it just to keep it safe so that people didn't fall into it. Here's a picture of it with the, the fence in place from slightly further down. So hopefully you can see we've been really, really busy. I'm gonna wrap up at that point with a picture of the milepost which, uh, at uh, Utoxeter with the plaque in place and a view in the background to the old wharf and where the canal was. So that's me done for now. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much, Steve. That was uh, that was fascinating. That was great. How how long is the Utoxeter Canal? Thirteen miles. Okay, um, that uh, that's a definitive answer. So, we'll just... <laughs> so the original section that we're looking to restore is about seven miles, and the section that we would relocate is about six miles. Right, and then a very popular question that we've had is. Um, why is Froggle Tunnel so low? And are there any plans <laughs> to increase the headroom? It, curiously, it hasn't subsided. People think that the, the tunnel has subsided, it hasn't. It was just built that way. If, if you look at the sort of freight that was passing through there, and it was basically open barges loaded with um, limestone that had come from the quarries, and there was no need for it to be built any higher. Um, so it, it, it was like that. It was just... Yeah, it, it met it's it met it served the purpose that it needed to serve. Of course, in in sort of more modern times, it's become a problem. And part of the two thousand and two project was to try and do something about it. And British Waterways had an idea that what they would do is they would lower the water level in that final pound all the way back to Flint Mill Lock over a couple of miles. Uh, but they discovered that a repair that had been done in the nineteen eighties had put a concrete plinth just about half a mile outside Frog Hall, and that they couldn't lower the water by more than about six inches, because then boats, if they lowered it any further, boats would catch on this plinth further down. So they've done as much as they can for the time being. Right, okay, well that's, uh, that, that certainly <laughs> answered that one. Um, I guess that uh, a lot of the other um, uh, restoration bodies who, who may have tuned into this uh, are wondering, um, was or is the line of uh, the, the Utoxeter Canal all under one ownership or have you had any issues with having to try and recover parts of it from other landowners? 
Well, I, I talked about the problem with Bridge 70, um, and that was a very, very curious one. Um, it, was, it was a hole in land ownership, and we knew who owned the land all the way around it, but not the bridge itself. Um, but the other bits of air, the areas we've worked on, we've worked on land owned by South Staffs Water, we've worked on land owned by JCB and various other locals. And, and we've had very good relationships. I and mean, the canal is in lots of different ownerships. A substantial part of it's owned by the Churnit Valley Railway. We have a good relationship with them. And, and so far, it's not caused us any problems. Does the railway have any plans to extend further along the line of the canal? Yes. When we started uh, doing the work down at, um, at Crumpwood, at, at Bridge 70, our first work party had to be cancelled at short notice. We we're right next to a pumping station there and they got some operational problems that meant we couldn't work on that site. And we relocated to work up at Jackson's Wood, which is next to California Lock. And for that, and that's very, very close to the Churnit Valley Railway, um, and they allowed us to go into that site using some um, hand-operated wagons so we could push tools to and from the site. And some of you may have remembered that when we, um, when we finished working in Jackson's Wood, we ran a special train down there and, and let people go and have a look at that. The track was subsequently taken up because it was not in good enough condition to run steam train services. And there is a plan at the moment to put the track back. Those who know the Churnit Valley Railway will know they're extending into Leak at the moment. And when they've done that, their next extension will be back down parallel to the Utoxta Canal towards Oakmoor. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's... Um, probably uh, about all we've got time for. I'm sure that uh, a number of people would uh, probably want to go out and uh, clap for carers now. Um, so thank you very much indeed again, Steve. That's, that's been really, really fascinating evening. Uh, and thank you all, everybody who, who has tuned in. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you missed any of it, you'll be able to catch it again um, from next week, I imagine, uh, on IWA's uh, YouTube. Uh, so I think um, for this evening, thank you very much and uh, stay safe, stay well and uh, hope that uh, the physical restoration can get back going as soon as possible. <laughs>